Aren't you glad that death is defeated and the king is alive today? Why don't we just put our hands together right now and magnify him. Jesus, we thank you today. God, we ask that you'd reach down and touch. Move in this place today and let us feel your presence and we give you the glory in Jesus' wonderful name. Thank you, Jesus. As we go to the Lord in prayer today, is there anyone that has a special request? Brother Blunt. Pray for Brother Anthony today, Brother Anthony Trimble. Anybody else? Remember Sister Lambert? Remember our prodigal Lambert, Brother Brandon? Remember my uh, my sister, my older sister and her daughter? As a matter of fact, uh, I'm hoping to see her this week. They're coming to St. Louis for, uh, and hopefully we can make, get time to see them this week. Any other requests? If you need prayer today, you come. We'll pray for you right now. God will reach down and and touch today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy today. Reach down, touch Brother Trimble today. I know that you're the healer. You're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works within us. You're the strength of our life and our satisfying portion today. Touch Noana today. Touch LaDonna, we ask it in your precious, wonderful name. God, you're the King of kings, of the Lord of lords, and you sit upon your throne of mercy and grace today. Touch Brother Trimble right now, God, and let your healing virtue flow. You are the King today, and you know all things, and you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works within us. We give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise today because we know that you still are the healer. You still are the deliverer today. You're able to give revival in this place, and in our hearts and in our lives today. God, we ask it in your precious, wonderful name. Come down and touch us, oh God, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. How we save me, how we raise me. How we fill me with the Holy Ghost. How we heal me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord. How he picked me up and turned me around. How he placed my feet on solid ground. When I think about the Holy Ghost, how 
we heal me to the uttermost when I think about the Lord, how he picked me up and turned me around, how he placed my feet on solid this morning. The offering pans are up here, so if you would just bring your offering to the front. Brother Blunt, would you pray over this offering? Would you pray over the offering? shattered you see whole I see broken you see beautiful and you're helping me to believe that you're restoring me There's nothing too dirty that you can make worthy. You wash me in mercy. I am clean. There's nothing too dirty that you can make worthy. You wash me in mercy.
Aren't you glad for his sacrifice that he shed in our hearts and our lives today? Thank you, Jesus. I'm glad for the mercies and the grace of God. I'm going to try to sing an old, old song. It's written in five flats. Uh, I will try to try it in C. I know that's a much better key. If you know it, would you sing it with me? If I can sing it in this key, if not, we have to raise it. As I know, five flats, they don't like to play in five flats. That means it's all black keys. And the pianist doesn't like to do black keys. <laughs> my, thanks, my thanks to him. <laughs> huh? You'd rather do it in D? 
<laughs> I'd rather didn't be. I think we do it in anger. Well, that's pretty high, but go ahead. <laughs> we'll see if we can do it. I love to tell. It's too loud. How Jesus saved my soul. Will you help me? When I was lost and facing dark despair, no it Rhonda that's probably a good key for you it's not the right key for them it's too high huh? they said yeah it was too high it was D D if you can do it D I love to tell how Jesus saved my soul when I was lost and facing dark despair, but mortal tongue could never tell the whole, or thank Him for the love that He has shown. For He blessings here my life on earth will not be long enough for sing it for he is more than all the world to me the dearest friend that I have ever known and he will take the whole eternity to thank him for 
that he has shown. For he is more than all the world to me. The dearest friend that I have ever known. And it will take the whole eternity to Just raise your hands and love him death with me today. Jesus, we thank you today, God. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords today, and we feel your presence. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for grace and mercy today. <clears throat> thank you for your sweet presence that we feel in this house. For he is more than all the world to me. Do you feel his presence? The dearest friend that I have ever known. And it will take the whole eternity to thank him for the love that he has shown for he is more than all the world to be the dearest friend that I have ever known and it will take Blessed be your name today, God. Blessed be your name today, Jesus. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Blessed be your name today. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus is the sweetest name I know, and he's just the same as his lovely name, that's the reason why. His presence today. For Jesus is the sweetest name I know, and He's just the same as His lovely name. today. <clears throat> we live in perilous times. We live in troubled times. And I believe God is trying to say something to us. I want us to read today from Revelations, the second chapter, beginning at verse 1. 
While they're bringing that up, I want to remind you that tomorrow evening at 6.30 here at the church is for all of our overcomers. That's 50 and above. Uh, we're going to have a annual, uh, or every other month, whatever you want to call it, overcomers dinner. We'd encourage you to come, be part of that time of fellowship. And then we're going to come in here and just uh, worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things, said he, that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labors and thy patience, and how thou canst bear not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hath found them liars, and hath borne, and hath patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. Nevertheless, everybody say nevertheless, that means there's something else coming. I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the work, first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick from his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, everybody said, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. I want to preach this morning on this thought. God speaks to the church. God speaks to the church. Let's pray and ask God to touch us today. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your spirit that has swept into this house. We thank, thank you for the sweetness that we feel in your presence today. God, we ask that you would come down and, and touch us and speak to us at Cornerstone Apostolic Church today. Let us have an ear to hear what you want to say to us. We ask it today in Jesus' wonderful name. Lord bless you. You may be seated. Somebody wrote a little poem. It's called Revival. It's God's Way. I want to read it to you today. Where is the hope for revival? God's Holy Spirit outpoured, convicting of sin and of judgment and the righteousness of the Lord. When nothing else is important, only God's presence divine. When Christians quit worldly pleasures, then God hears his ear, will incline. Desperate prayer for revival will cleanse the church by the word. Then clothed in spotless white linens, the bride clears the way for her Lord. Prayer is the key to revival, prayer that is true, spirit-born. Nights of compassionate weeping, intercession for all the forlorn. Then will the burden be lifted, then all sinners will cry, then all the chains will be loosened and worldly passions will die. The lost ones will yield to God's Spirit. When Christians cleanse, weep, and pray, God's living water flows outward. This is revival, God's way. Charles Finney, a great revivalist of many, many years ago, made this statement. The fact is, Christians are more to blame for not being revived than sinners are, are for not being convicted. I want to read that again. The fact is, Christians are more to blame for not being revived than sinners are for not being converted. We should... 
be praying. I think we should be praying the prayer of Psalms 85 and 6 and 7. It says, Thou wilt not revive us. Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. We still need to believe that God can speak to us from his word. We need to have the attitude that is found in the next two verses of that same Psalms. I will hear what God, the Lord, will speak. For he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. So first he says, Wilt thou revive us again, that thy people may rejoice? Show us mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. And then he says, I will hear what God the Lord will speak. We need to listen to hear what God's trying to say. Sometimes we are so filled with the things that go on around us, and we are so filled with all of the hype and the the things that are happening in this world that we forget to take time to stop and listen to what God is trying to say to us. Habakkuk 3 and 2 says, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy works in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known in wrath. Remember mercy. Our Pentecostal or let me rephrase that, this Pentecostal generation needs to repent of our familiarity with biblical truth. You say, Brother McCarty, you don't, don't think we need to believe truth? That's not what I said. I said we need to repent of our familiarity with truth. Sometimes we come, become so familiar with truth that we don't listen when God speaks to us. And we need to recover the fear of the Lord. We don't fear the Lord anymore. I didn't even get an amen on that, but we don't fear God anymore. When I was, when I was younger and growing up, if, if they preached about the coming of the Lord, that scared me to death. I spent 23 or 24 weeks preaching about the coming of the Lord or teaching about the coming of the Lord, and it didn't seem to faze anybody. God's coming soon, folks. We need to listen to what he's saying. We have lost what it is like to fear God. God spoke to Habakkuk, and he was afraid because he realized the condition of his life and his nation. Our nation, we need to fear for ourselves, and we need to fear for our nation today because our nation is headed down the wrong path. He prayed for revival and he cried out for God's mercy. And he understood because he became aware of God's presence. We are so familiar with truth and we're so familiar with being in the presence of God that we have really lost the awe of God's presence in our lives. He petitioned for revival because he understood what revival was. How can we pray for revival if we have no understanding of what revival really is? We say we're going to have revival. The day, you know, the, actually, uh, the days of revival, uh, like uh, I grew up knowing, has long passed. I didn't get an amen on that one either. You're awful quiet today. You're probably not going to like what God's going to say today. <laughs> but you know what? The days of revival like I knew them and, and like some of you knew them, eight, ten weeks revival with not a night off, we can't get people to come. Preach it, sister. We can't get people to come on Wednesday night. If we try to have a two-day revival of Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, they might come one of those nights. And it probably would be Sunday morning and Sunday night. 
because we don't fear God and we don't fear the presence of God. So how can we petition God or pray for revival if we have no understanding of what revival is? You know what, I'm going I'm to tell, tell you today what revival is not. Revival is not some special meeting. It's not us gathering together in some service and calling it revival. It is not rallies. It's not retreats. It's not seminars. It's not conferences. I got one from Brother Tudoro today. It's not, and this is probably going to shock you, but it's not the salvation of sinners. That's not revival. You say, well, I thought that's what we wanted. We wanted people to be saved. Yes, we do, and they need to be saved, and sinners need to be stirred. But that's not what revival is because revival is for saints only. We kind of have have misused the term because revival is for saints only. Revival is for those who are alive. And have spiritual ears to hear what God is saying. And for those who will listen to what the Lord is saying to us, the church, that's revival. A sinner cannot be, cannot be revived. You know why a sinner can't be revived? Because he has never been born. He's still dead in his sins. So he can't be revived. If we want revival as we term it today, then the church, you and I need to wake up and listen to what God is saying so that we can see the birth of sinners. That's revival. We need sinners to be born into the kingdom of God. That's what revival is. A sinner cannot be revived because he's never been alive. He has to have a life before he can be revived. You're in a bad car accident and you're unconscious and, and you're not breathing. They come and they begin to give you a mouth-to-mouth recitation. And I had to go through all kinds of courses to learn how to do all that stuff and, and count and, and, and beat the heart to get the heart start beating. And, that, and, and then if they gas and they take a breath, then they have, they have been revived. They have been brought back from that state of of urgency. And and the church needs to be revived because of the urgency of the day and the hour. Ephesians 1 and 2 says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. He quickens us. Revival is exclusively, exclusively for us. We need to wake up. We need to get revived. We need to get a new spirit of urgency. We need to get new breath into us. We need to get new life into us. We need to get new life into our church. And it comes because the saints of God get resurrected from their state of lethargicness. Our lattice and that lukewarmness. Revelation 2, in addressing the church of Ephesians, God had already told them that they were quickened from death and sin. And now they are alive in Christ. And and he tells them to hear, if they have ears, to hear. He asked that several times down through this chapter of Revelations. I didn't read all of it, but you, you go down and read it. He asked that several times. He that hath an ear, let him hear. Everybody reach up and wiggle your ear. You have ears? But just because you have ears doesn't mean that you hear what you are saying. When our kids were little, they were really good at hearing what they wanted to hear and not hearing what they didn't want to hear. I could say, Kevin, take out the trash. And an hour later, the trash would still be there. And I'd say, didn't you hear me? He said, no, Dad, I didn't hear you. He had ears, but he didn't hear. But if I said, you want to go do something he liked to do, he would hear me right away. That we have, we have ears to hear what God is saying to us. Are we listening? If we have ears to hear, then we need to listen to what God is trying to tell us. And here in Revelations, the second chapter, verse 1, God 
talks to the church of Ephesus, and he's still talking to the church today. If he talked to the church of Ephesus, he can talk to the church today. And he still he is still uh, uh, he is still accessible to us. He still speaks to us. And he's still listening. He's still talking to the church today. Do we have ears to hear what God is trying to say? Are we listening to what he is really saying to us? The second verse says, I know thy works. He, 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 you know, he, he comments. He, he, he uh, gives them compliments. I know thy works, thy labors, thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. He gives them compliments. How many like to get a compliment? We like to get a compliment, but sometimes we don't like to hear what comes after that. But, you know, I really appreciate what you're doing, but you need to do something else. And we like the compliments, but we don't like to hear what he says. God always compliments, and then he tells us what needs to be done. And he says in verse 4, he says, nevertheless... In other words, there's something coming that I'm going to tell you, and here's what you need to hear. I have somewhat against thee because thou hast, what, left thy first love. And then he gives us some things that we need to do. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do thy first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest. Then he goes back and he tells them, here's some, here's, you, you know, you're not all bad, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church. To him that overcometh will I give him to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the garden of the paradise of God. He gives us a promise. He tells us he, throughout this whole chapter, he gives them uh, their, their commendation. He has something good to say about them. Then he tells them what they need to do, and then he comes back and he gives them another compliment. So he places emphasis on three important words in this reading a scripture today to the Ephesus church. He says you have to remember, you need to repent, and you need to remove. Remember from where you're fallen. You know what? We need to think back over our lives and remember how much we loved God. Remember how we loved to be in His presence. Remember how we we loved the feeling of the warmth (coughs) <coughs> and the tenderness and the fervor and the spark and the unction that we used to feel when we walked into the presence of God. Can I let Sam punch down a little bit? <coughs> we like, you know what? When look, Just think back. Remember back when you first received God's presence in your life. You enjoyed being in His presence. We enjoyed the unction of the Holy Ghost as it came upon us. We desired to walk into the presence of God. We desired that we desired that favor and that and that fellowship and communion with Him. We desired praying and we desired sharing and, and the. The consciousness and awareness of His presence was all around us, and we so felt the presence of God. You remember how God used to move on you and how the tears flowed and and how the presence of God shook you from from the the top of your head to the the soles of your feet and and you enjoyed the rejoicing of His presence and how it filled your heart. That's the first love. This first love does not necessarily refer to the love that you had at first. It's not just what you felt at first. It doesn't necessarily speak of the love in the way of order, but it's talking about the degree of your love. You know, this is it, it's kind of hard to explain uh, because 
when you first fall in love, when I first fell in love with my wife, um, we had that excitement and that giddiness about it, and we, we really enjoyed each other's presence. But after 51 years, love hasn't left, but it's changed. And it changes with intensity. It's just different. It's not giddy anymore, but it's a deep feeling that you have for each other. And we need to have that, not just that giddiness about God, but we need to have a relationship with God that goes much deeper than just a surface relationship, something that gets down on the inside. My wife tells me, and I tell her almost every day how much I, I love her and, and how beautiful I think she is, and she says, I don't know what I would do without you. That's the kind of love that we have to have with inside of our hearts and our lives for God. God, I don't just want to jump up and run and, and shout and run the aisles, but I want a relationship with you that says, God, I can't go another day if I don't feel your presence. God, I can't live another moment if I don't feel that deep longing and that deep love down inside of me that makes me do things that I would have never done before because, God, I love you with a deep intensity. Not how you felt when you were first saved, but the love that the Ephesians left. For he is the bread of life, and he is the water of life, and he's described as the rose of Sharon and the bride and the morning star, and he's described as the lily of the valley. If you're, if you're experiencing a greater delight, the moment you believed that you are feeling right now, then something is wrong with your relationship with God. You ought to long to be in His presence more than when you first received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You ought to long to be in His service. You ought to long to be in His presence. You ought to spend time with Him more now than you did when you first walked into the uh, apostolic church because there has to be that deep love that flows through you. Someone as well said it like this, the better we know him, the more we love him. And the more we know him and love him, the more we trust him. And the more we know and love him and trust him, the more will be the evidence of him in us. God, let people be able to see in me your love. Let me be able to let people be able to see your love in me. That first love is the love that sparks our devotion to Christ. But I want to ask you today to examine your first love. How devoted are you to God? How many times we have lived from one spiritual emotion, uh, emotional high to another? How many times? It, do we, we used to say how many times you live from camp meeting to camp meeting or conference to conference. And, but it's not more than just a camp meeting excitement. It's not more than just a con, general conference excitement. But it's that deep down love that says I have to have a deeper relationship with God. How many times, uh, we, you know, we live from that romantic infatuation to another romantic touch from God, uh, but it's, it goes beyond that romantic fa infatuation with God. Uh, we think we are in love with Jesus, but our love never matures, uh, and we only have an immature love for Him. And it's tragic if that immaturity persists in us for 35 or 40 years because we never grow deeper in God. But he wrote a song, I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. We are the bride of Christ. How long has it been since you renewed your wedding vows? How long has it been since we, you, you've re renewed them and told God how much you needed Him? How long has it been since you have told Him how much you love Him? How long has it been since you spent time in His Word? How long has it been since you got out of your bed in the, in the middle of the night and, and fell down on your knees and said, God, I need 
you, God. I need you, God. I can't go another step without you. I can't live without you, God. Remember that he first loved us. And to remember our first love for him is, is one of the ways that we know the thrill of being his. God, when God moves in our spirit, it ought to thrill us again and again and again. And every time God walks in and begins to speak to us, whether it's through the word of God or whether it's through a song or whether it's through me picking up his word and reading it myself or whether I'm just, I'm just at home by myself, when God walks in and you begin to feel his presence, it ought to thrill you. Mediocrity and monotony are banished by that first love. Instability and unfaithfulness are expelled by that first love. You won't have a trouble, you won't have any trouble coming to church if you love God. If you really love Him. The Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, even the more so as you see the day approaching. What's happening? What's happening around in, in, in the denominal world? What's happening in the apostolic world? The coronavirus hasn't helped. Amen. I'll amen myself. Coronavirus hasn't helped. We, gotta, we have to fall in love with him every day. We have to have a closer relationship with him every day. If you love him with your first love, you will never serve him halfway. If you love him with that first love, you will never worship insincerely. If you, if you love him with your first love, you will never leave a task that's undone. If you love him with your first love, you will always be faithful over little things regardless of the rewards. Some people do things to get a reward from people. They, get a re they, they do things to get somebody to pat them on the back and say, you did a good job. But it doesn't matter whether you, anybody sees you do what you do for God. What matters is if you're doing it because you love God. How long has it been since you sat across the table with somebody and told them that you wanted to teach them a Bible study? I know it's getting harder and harder to get them, Bible studies. How long has it been since you sat across the table from a, a loved one that you love and have said, I, I need to tell you what, what God just wants you to know? Oh, Brother McCarty, I don't want to make them mad. It's not a matter of making them mad. It's, ma it's a matter of getting them saved. How long is it, how is it in your life today? Just examine yourself today. How is it in your life today? Were there better days? What is, what is it or what is it that thrills your heart more than Jesus Christ? What causes you more excitement than Jesus Christ? We send a van load of kids. We send a van load to kids to junior camp. And I want them to I wanted them to come back and say, I love that so much. Sister Leah told me that one of the little Spanish girls was praying and the tears were flowing and after service they asked her if she received the Holy Ghost. She said, Yeah, I received the Holy Ghost. And then on the way home she asked Sister Leah, Sister Leah, what's the Holy Ghost? You know what? I want them to know. I want them to know that Cornerstone Apostolic Church loves them and that God loves them and that they can have a relationship with God. They may speak in tongues 20 times before they ever acknowledge the fact that, they, that that's the way they know they have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But when they get it and they really know they're going to have that experience deep down inside of Him, I'm never going to tell them, that's good, you got it. You just come back and get more. We prayed for a girl when we were in, in another church and, and assistant pastors in another church. We prayed for her for years. 
she would speak in tongues and speak in tongues, and the tears would flow, and, and we would say, did you receive the Holy Ghost? And she'd say, no. But one night we were praying with her, and when she and something different happened inside of her. I don't know what it was. Well, I do know what it was. It was it was the acknowledgement, and that finally she realized what was happening, and her facial feature changed. And when she came through, nobody had to ask her, "Did you? What did you receive the Holy Ghost?" When she came came through and be stopped praying, she looked around and she said. I got the Holy Ghost tonight. I'm here to tell you there has to be that experience inside of you that says, I got it tonight. I want to get some more of it. I've got to have more of you. I want to love you more. I want to serve you more, God. I want to do whatever you want to do, God. We have to have that mindset of the Spirit. And the second word is repent. Repent. The church is called to repent. Ephesus was called to repent. We're called to repent. Why? Because sin was there and sin had been committed. That second verse of Revelation 2 says this, I know your works, labors, your patience, and that you cannot bear those that are evil and that you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. God says, I know your good works, and I know how hard you're working. I know that you are patient. I know you hate evil. I I know that you have uh, tested those that say they're apostles and they're not, and you hate them. I do too. But he still called them to repentance. Why? Because they had left their first love. They made a conscious decision. They laid it aside. They omitted it and sent it away. And they had broken the greatest commandment. And all their works, and all their labors, and all that they were doing, they hated evil, but they still broke the first commandment. Deuteronomy 6 and 5. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. That's the first commandment. I have to love God with everything that is inside of me. Everything that is inside of me. That is not, you know, this is not what you want to, uh, it's not I want to love. It's not, well, I really want to love him, but it is a have to love. Thou shalt or you must love me. Mark 12 and 29, and Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt, I'm not stuttering, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. There is no other commandment that's greater than loving God. All the others hinge on the fact that you love God. You won't have a tr- you won't have any trouble c- obeying any of the other commandments if you love God. You won't have any problems with uh, with sin in your life if you love God. Uh, you won't have any trouble going to the wrong places if you love God. You won't have any trouble saying the wrong things if you love God. Uh, you have to love God. Cornerstone, we have to love God more than we love anything else in this world. He is the Lord, Jehovah Yahweh. There is no other greater God, one God. That's truth. Polytheism or multiple gods is a false truth. He is our God. He is a personal. He is a, we need to have a personal relationship with our God. I, I like Southern gospel music, and they say so much. He's a personal Savior. He's mine, I know. I love him so. That's what we have to have, that personal relationship. It's a daily experience. We, we, we are related to him, and we are his people, and we are his sons and his daughters. And so we should love, adore, and worship God before anything else. He's our Lord. He is the focus of my concentration. He, he is everything in my life. He has all of my attentions. I worship Him. I love Him. I praise Him. He's the only subject of our devotion. There is no reason, no excuse for distraction by any other object than to love God. We can't do that 
by ourselves. We can't do it by ourselves. It is when God himself infuses infuses his love inside of our hearts and our love is expressed back to him. When God comes down and comes down and fills us with his mighty, wonderful presence, then it's not hard for me to return that love. It's hard to love somebody when they hate you. We're we're commanded to do that. He said, love your enemies. Sometimes we want to chop their heads off. That's human nature. But it's not hard to love somebody that loves you. And it's not hard to love God because he gave his life for us. He died at Calvary for me. He shed his blood at Calvary for me. And I love him. You know what? Romans 5 and 5 says, Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. That's how the love of God gets in our hearts and lives. By His Spirit. We call it the Holy Ghost, which is given. It's given unto us. All we have to do is accept it. How can you not accept the love of God that died at Calvary for us? He gave his life so that you can be saved. If sin's been committed, then there should be repentance for that sin. And not loving God is a sin. And you have to repent, the Bible says, and do the first works over. That's why it's so important that every day we learn how to repent. Because sometimes every day we do something that may not be in God's divine wisdom and love. We pass it off and we say, well, the Lord knows I love him. How many times have you said, well, they, they know. God, you know, a husband and wife, sometimes they've lived together so long, and, and once one of them says, I love you, and, and you never return that, and, and you say, well, I, you know I love you. No. My wife is much more verbal about that than my, I am. I'm trying to be more verbal about that. But we gotta, sometimes we just have to verbalize it. And there's, and, and there's more things, there's other things we can do to, to prove that we love that, love them. But we have to say, God, I love you. We rationalize ourselves into a sense of peace and security. And the Lord says, repent. You and I must do something about it. We must take the initiative. Because I'm his child and I must run to him. If I thought when I was a child, when I was younger, and I thought, if I thought that I did something that hurt my mother, I would not quit until I ran to her and said, Mama, I'm sorry that I did that. And a lot of times it was filled with tears and I'd hug her and I'd say, Mama, I love you and I'm sorry I did that. And she would always say, What? I love you too, honey. It's okay. That's what we have to do with God. We have to run to him and say, God, I'm sorry I made that mistake. And he reaches down with his love and he puts his arms around us and he says, I love you too. And I've covered in your sin. If we'd want to do something for, you know, if he wants, wants to do something for me, uh, that would be nice, but uh, God, I, you don't really have to, but uh, it would be nice if you did. No, that's not the way God is. God wants us to love him and to say, God, I'm sorry. James 4 and 7 through 10 talks about some initiatives that happen. It says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning, and your joy into heaviness. Humble yourself in the sight of God, in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. You cannot express your love for God by just giving gifts. For nothing we give to God can be substituted for ourselves. 
And so here's what it says. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Draw near to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. And I need to say, God, I want you to cleanse me. I want your hand, I want my hands to be cleansed. I want my heart to be cleansed. I want my mind to be cleansed. I want my I want to be purified in your presence. Because sin cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. Draw near to him and pursuing him. We have to pursue God. David said, as the heart panteth after the water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. God pursues us, but we also have to pursue him. We have to run to him. We have to draw nigh to him. We can't afford to be spiritually stagnant. We can't afford to be just content where we are. We can't afford to just have a status quo, but we need to pursue him. Because yesteryear should not be the day of my best love for God. Yesterday, when I was younger, should not be my best days for God. I should love him more today than I did when I was seven years old. When I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I should love him more today. You know why? Because I understand him more today. I've learned to trust him more today. He's seen me through so much more now that I'm older. And we have to say, God, here I am. Forgive me. The third and last word is remove. You see, if we don't do the first two, then he'll come along and remove the candlestick from its place. And I, I understand and I know that in the book of Revelation, he's writing to the, the uh, candlestick, represents the leadership of the church, and, and I understand all of that. But we also it also becomes personal if we don't ask God to forgive us then he'll come along and remove our light. If you don't repent, your witness will become a negative witness. If you don't repent and ask God to forgive you, then the light of your witness will be snuffed out. And the light is indeed darkness. If the light is darkness, how great is the darkness after we have known what it is to have the light of God in our hearts and our lives. How much darker will we become if we don't have the light of God after it's once been lit in our lives? It becomes darker. You know why? If you don't repent, your witness will be negative. Your light becomes darker. Your testimony is negative. You come from somebody you used to know when you was on fire. You're not on fire and you're doing something. Well, I thought you, I thought you used to live for God. What do you say? You, you, you didn't used to act like that. You didn't used to say those things. What do you say? Because the light's gone. The darkness is gone. You know what the Lord says, repent or else he will remove the light. The judgment seat of Christ awaits every believer. We will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And that's a sobering, serious, solemn thing to think about. That one of these days we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we will stand in his presence. And we will have to give an account to him for everything we said or did if we have not kept it under the blood of Jesus Christ. We will be held accountable for what we could have been. You will be held accountable for what you could have done. 
and say that I love you and, and with my lips and, and my heart is far from you. You know, it's easy to say I love you, but where's the heart? You know, lip service is not good enough until you reach the place where the Bible says, from out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. That can go either way. What is your heart filled with? If it's filled with evil and it once once was filled with good, you're still going to be judged and stand before the judgment seat of Christ with a heart that is filled with evil. Because the heart can say, oh, I used to love you, God. But I don't, I, I really didn't love you like I really should have loved you because there were some things that should not have been in my life. See, your relationship with Christ should not weaken through the years, but it should grow stronger through the years. If it doesn't, he's going to remove the light. God is speaking to the church today. And like the men on the road to Emmaus, Jesus joined them as they were talking about all the things that had happened in Jerusalem, all the things that happened, and they, and they were talking about what the crucifixion and those things. And he, he walked up beside them. And he, they invited him to dinner when they got home. And he goes in and he breaks bread with them and then he's gone. And they run back and they tell the disciples, our hearts burned within us when we walked with him in the way. Does your heart burn within you? When he speaks, do you listen? And when you listen, do you obey? It's one thing to say, I hear you, God. It's another thing to do what he asks you to do. There's a song that says he speaks. And the sound of his voice. As we stand this morning. Is so sweet. The birds hush their singing, and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever speaks and the sound of his voice with your eyes closed is so sweet the birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me Within my heart is ringing, and he walks with me, and he talks. Is God talking to you today? joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. These altars are open if you want to come and pray. If you feel like turning around where you are and praying, 
I think God's trying to speak to us today. He speaks in the sound of His voice. is so sweet. The birds hush their singing. And the melody that He gave to me. I would encourage you to come and find a place to pray today. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy time he speaks and the sound of his voice are you listening to his voice today it's so sweet you want more of him today they're singing and the melody that he gave to me with Joy we share as we take. 